this red light, and how does this reflect into today? How do we interpret the land promises today? And what I will do is what I have here, a Christ-centered biblical theology of the promised land. Christ-centered because we are Christians, and as I will argue, we cannot read the Bible as if Christ did not come. Uh, this is a question about the land and the promised land that I literally spent years uh, of my life doing and investigating and writing about. And at the end, we'll uh, give you a list of books if you want to uh, read more. Uh, and today I will just give a few points with some tips and Bible verses. Uh, but really, each slide that I will have or each point needs a whole. I, I could easily spend the whole hour just ex, uh, expanding on. Uh, some points I will move on faster than others because they have been covered by uh, Yusuf's presentation uh, yesterday. Uh, but in all, uh, really, if, if uh, at any point uh, at the end I will need time for, if you have questions about a certain point, feel free uh, to ask me. This is a time again where we will just spend time in the Bible asking the question about the land, the promises of the land, and how we can interpret these promises uh, in our context uh, today. Uh, and let me just begin by saying that uh, uh, my investigation, our investigation of the land is, is not done in a vacuum. I said this in my first presentation. We don't write theology in libraries, but we write it in checkpoints. Uh, we talk about conflict. So we cannot have the discussion of the land detached from the reality of the conflict today. Uh, and again, from the fact that it is influencing and, and, and how we interpret the Bible, uh, you know, have, have real consequences uh, on the ground in this particular topic. Uh, the Bible and the way it has been used has been very, very troubling, and this has been reflected uh, in multiple ways uh, yesterday, uh, just two, two weeks ago, or maybe less, there was a big public uh, lecture in my hometown in Beit Zahir <coughs> by uh, a Palestinian Christian intellect and a professor in a university uh, about the Canaanites and the use of the Bible. And he basically made the point to the approval of almost 70 leaders and intellects that the Bible, uh, the Old Testament is all a myth. And that's the kind of reaction that we are seeing among many uh, reacting to the way in which the Hebrew scriptures have been used against uh, Palestinians. Uh, and, you know, we just touched the surface uh, of, of how uh, the Bible had been used. Uh, I literally had pastors come to me and say, yes, uh, the Israelites can read Joshua chapter 6 about the destruction of Jericho and killing everyone and apply it today. Israel can apply this today. Uh, and this was a brother in Christ uh, telling me this who pastors a mega church. In, in. So how do you how do we deal with the Bible in this difficult question? So this is all keep that in mind that I will try to really uh, investigate this, uh, this question. Uh, I will do something that I, I would give myself an F if I was evaluating my paper today because it's 15 points. So, never had a paper with 15 points. Nevertheless, this is what I'm going to do 15 points, and each point, as I said, will need a lot of time to uh, unpack, but I will just touch on, on questions. Uh, and they will be in the form of questions and answers. The first one is to whom does the land belong? And I think this is where we need to start. Uh, it's important to emphasize that in the Bible, it is very, very clear that the land always belongs to God. Every land belongs to God. Uh, not just the whole creation, including the particular promised land in the biblical narrative. Uh, uh, the Bible emphasizes that it never becomes our possession. That we possess nothing, as I will argue. Uh, everything remains to God. In Leviticus 25, it's clear, the land, talking about the promised land, the land is mine. You are like strangers in my land. 
No one can claim, well, it's mine now because God gave it. You know, even after he says, I'm giving you the rabbi, he says, it remains my life. It's a very important point. Uh, the uh, former Latin patriarch of Jerusalem, Michel Sabah, a Palestinian Christian, says, land has a particular status in the Bible. It belongs to God. Biblical Israel, therefore, could not become the absolute owner of the land. It was only God's guest. The worst possible thing that could befall Israel would be to forget this truth, to settle the land, and to substitute it for God in, the, in its worship and value system. Exactly, this is what happened in the biblical land, especially with the temple, and one could argue this is what's happening today in the way in which many idealize uh, the land. The verse, the land is mine, comes in the context of the Jubilee laws, uh, again, it's fascinating to me how people who want to use the Bible just select, they select the land promises but ignore the Jubilee laws. Are you aware of the Jubilee laws? Okay. Imagine, no one talks today about applying the Jubilee laws. But we use the book of Leviticus to attack people or to say the land belongs to God. The Jubilee law, basically after 50 years, you go back, you know, you distribute the land among you and your families equally, whereas it never becomes your possession. It's my land. I, I give it to you for the good of the community. Uh, it needs to serve the socioeconomic justice of the community. Uh, and it should give equal, not just justice, but equal opportunities. That's why after 50 years, if some family for some reason lost its land, that was given to it as a, as a mandate, or uh, their children became slaves in another family. After 50 years, everybody goes back to point zero to give an equal opportunity. This is how land is to be used. Yet we turned it, or the Bible was turned into a way to gain power and possession and to control people. This is in the Bible, again, the way the land is being used. I always say, I wish Christian Zionists applied the Jubilee laws. And give us that. You know, you think of the, of, of the logic behind that. But of course, we select a certain verse, not everything else. Uh, the boundaries of the land, that's my second point. What is the promised land? This was touched yesterday, so I'll be quick. But basically, if we read this verse in Genesis 15, on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river of the Euphrates. So, quick point, if Christian Zionists are consistent in the way they use the Bible, that Israel today, they should call for Israel to occupy Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Or else don't use the Bible, because that is the boundaries of the promised land. Again, we are very selective, and we, let, you know, we, we ignore the bigger picture. Even in the biblical history itself, this is, uh, Jonathan touched on this yesterday, I think that Two and a half tribes settled in the east of the river. That's this map. And this is the boundary of, of Solomon, in the second map. In other words, you know, at, at least be consistent in the way you apply uh, the Bible law. Uh, but if we are more serious about our reading the Bible, we will discover that the land never had these fixed borders. Because one could argue that the land was always supposed to expand. Uh, you know, God told Abraham, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So the universal dimension of people and land has always been there from the first call of Abraham. It is always about restoring creation, the earth. God is not merely concerned with a small piece of land in the ancient Near East, today we call Palestine. His, his, his goal was the restoration of all creation. In fact, if you look at the Psalms, for example, uh, that speak about the boundaries of the Messianic land, the land that the Messiah should inherit. Psalm 2, 8 says, Ask of me, I will give you the nations as your inheritance, the ends of the earth as your possession. He's speaking to the King of Israel. We understand this, of course, as speaking to the Messiah. Keep this verse in mind, we will get back uh, to it. So that kind of universal dimension of the land has always been there because God is not merely concerned about Restoring one piece of land, but about the rest of it. Beginning from Jerusalem and then into the ends, or beginning from our land into the ends of the earth. So, those were my first, first point the land belongs to God. The second, it's, it's about the earth, not simply about the land. 
Number three, it's clear to me, how can you avoid this so that when you read the Bible, uh, the land has always had demands. Uh, the promises were always connected to the concept of the covenant, and in the covenant, you need to stay faithful to God, and then also you need to take care, good care of the land itself and be good to the community. The promises were conditional, because again, the land is not a possession, it's a mandate, it's an inheritance. And they are conditional to our ethical and moral behavior because God is concerned with other, our ethical and moral behavior. If we simply claim that God gives someone the land and doesn't care how we behave in that land, there's a problem with the nature of God. Uh, do you hear me here? It's, it's, it's a really serious uh, problem. Uh, the promises you know, have to do with how we deal with one another. But I, I could now list, literally, I, mean, I could list many, many verses. Uh, but just, just one or two will be enough. In Leviticus 18, it uses a very vivid and clear language. If you don't follow these ethical behaviors, the land will vomit you. And not only by the way it says, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you, emphasizing to the Israelites, you are much better than the ones who were before you. God does not show favoritism. Why? Because the land has demands. It is even here that the land itself that is vomiting. And by the way, in biblical history, this actually happened, the Babylonian exile. Because God is concerned about our moral and ethical behavior. Uh, and when it comes to losing the gift of land, how it was given, uh, in the Bible, you have to keep the covenant, and losing the land is tied with three sets of sins. The first is worshiping God, if you worship other gods, you. The second are uh, morality, uh, which is tied to the first. Then there is the second is the jubilee and Sabbath law, and the third set of laws have to do with the socio-economic justice. If you break any of these, you lose your right to the land. By the way, guess which one has more emphasis and more verses in the Bible? Social justice. The one on socio-economic justice. If there is no justice in the land, the Bible is clear. I will take the land. Can God take the land from the Israelites? Of course, because it's never theirs. It's always his land. Remember that. that in other words, no one can claim entitlement. No one can say I'm entitled to the land. No one can say I have a divine right to the land. These are important issues. Even after they return from exile. This is a very important verse. And again, many, many Christians point to prophecies and make them somehow speak about the state of Israel. 1948 from Ezekiel, but ignore this clear warning in the book of Ezekiel. And there we have God speaking to Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, the inhabitants of these waste places in the land of Israel keep saying, Well, Abraham was only one man, yet he got possession of the land. But we are many. The land is surely given to us to possess. You see, now they're using their linkage to Abraham as an entitlement to possess the land. Surely then they say the land is us to possess. Did you get that? Hmm. See how history repeats, it's amazing. This is thousands of years ago. They say, we are connected to Abraham. We're entitled to the land. How does God answer? He says, therefore say to them, thus says the Lord God, you eat flesh with the blood and lift up your eyes to your idols and shed blood. Shall you then possess the land? You depend on the sword. If I, you know, if we write, you know, this is written today. You depend on your military and the tanks that is given to you by the world. You rely on the sword. You commit abominations, and each of you defies his neighbor's wife. Shall you then possess the land? How is this clear? No one can say I am entitled uh, to the land. It's number two. Number four. Many Christians tell you, but 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 pastor, it's in the Bible. Uh, it's a possession forever. Again, all of that I have said compels us to revisit certain concepts that we were. Uh, for example, the idea of it's a Hebrew word, a halal, which is translated in the King James Bible as a possession. Whereas in the Bible it's clear it's never a possession. But you see how uh, culture context is determined, even how we. Certain words. Uh, 
uh, it's, it's a very, you know, dare I say, colonial way of translating, as if, you know, we possess things. Uh, the land was given as an inheritance. And we know that in ancient cultures, inheritance is not something that you can claim as yours so that you can sell and, and use for your own gain. It's always for the good of the community, realizing ultimately it belongs to God. I love this quote from Chris Wright, who explains the idea of inheritance. Like all tenants, therefore, uh, the Israelites were accountable to their divine Lord for proper treatment of what was ultimately his property. Because remember, election in the Bible is never about privilege, but it's always about responsibility. The idea of receiving the land as inheritance is like we are stewards uh, into God's creation. Uh, it's, it's like a mandate. Again, never becomes our own uh, possession. And even, and sorry here, just, uh, I'm going to challenge some, maybe for some are very uh, uh, basic teaching. Even the idea of having a literal understanding of words like forever. An eternal promise. Because in the Bible, we see this a lot. The land, the promises are eternal. Does this mean that eternal are not ending? As if, you know, if God promises uh, Moss or Joseph something, that's it, tell us whatever. I love this verse in, in Samuel because it explains this very well. God speaking to uh, uh, Eli, uh, I, 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 I will make you and your children sit before me as priests forever, he says, forever. And then immediately in the same sentence he says, But now says the Lord, far be it from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be treated with contempt. You got what I'm saying? In the same sentence God says, forever. And then he says, no, no, far be it from me. Why? Because forever is always tied with how we, it takes two, how we, we, we respond to God's grace, how we respond to, to God's initiation. All of these things, the Aaronic priesthood, the throne of David, the temple, and others, were promised to last forever in the Hebrew scripture. And then we know what happened, for example. The same with the, with the last promises. I hope now we begin to realize it's not that simple that we have a simplistic, literal reading uh, as if, you know, whatever means uh, for, for forever. Number five. Are you with me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, am I, I hope this is not too fast. No, we are here. Number five, who is Israel in the Bible? And before I continue with this point, I am asking the question as a Bible scholar. I'm not telling Jews how to define themselves. Okay, this is important. We shouldn't define Judaism for the Jews. We shouldn't define Israel for the Jews. Okay? They have the right to do this within their own tradition. Actually, this is something Jews hate the most when we define who Israel is uh, as Christians. And, and so there's, it, it, we shouldn't do that, okay? What I'm doing here is asking the question, in the Bible, how is Israel defined, okay? Uh, and, and this is an important question. Is it an ethical entity? And again, so many Christians, when you read their Bible, read their commentaries, they speak about the term ethnic Israel. And this drives me crazy, because we assume that God deals with us based on ethnic lines. Yusuf said it yesterday, God is not racist. And Yusuf, I think, covered this point very powerfully. Uh, in the Bible, we read about people like Ishmael and Ishu who were born in the family and not part of Israel, because it depends on God's grace and election. We read about someone like Ruth, who is always a Moabite, talked about her, born outside of Israel, yet was considered part of Israel. Why? Because he had faith in the, in the God of Israel. Don't we all like Ruth believe in the God of Israel? That's an important question, sisters and brothers. Uh, in the Bible, there are so many intermarriages. Read about it in Judges 3. Why am I saying this? So, so that I, I challenge the naive claim that there is a clear DNA from Abraham until anybody today. Uh, in Esther, we read about some people professing to be Jews, in other words, converting to Judaism. Uh, in Acts 2 5, we read about devout Jews from every nation. And then he names them, including Arab Jews. 
Judaism was already a multi-ethnic phenomenon in the first century. In other words, is Israel in the Bible defined by DNA? If we say yes, we make God a racist. Thank God that's not the reality. Should DNA matter? I ask this, it's important. Should DNA matter? Uh, and by the way, just to show you how, and, and, and I'm gonna sound a bit silly now. Uh, I know of many Palestinian friends who did the DNA test. You know, today in America, you can go and do the DNA test. Yeah. I know of many Palestinian friends who did the DNA test and discovered that 20, 30% of their line is, is Jewish. I say now, what can they inherit? One third of their land or? <laughs> it sounds silly, I know, but this is how we, this is the language of Christians today, that we think your ethnicity matters. I hope you're with me so far. Number six, the prophecies. Any of you did the test? I did it. Good. My brother did it. Uh, he was 14% uh, Ashkenazi. <laughs> so you get 14%. <laughs> you get upgraded from class three. <laughs> anyway, number six. Uh, is Israel of today a fulfillment of prophecy? Okay, is, is, that's, that's a question you know, it is shocking to me. By the way, I, I think I've part a lot of Christian Jewish dialogue. And one time, when I made the assertion that I don't believe Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy, the Protestant Christians in the room were all shocked. And the Jewish rabbi looked at them and says, yeah, are you shocked? Have you read the prophecies? <laughs> it, it's amazing how, again, it's Christians who impose these interpretations, not, not our Jewish friend. No. Is it a fulfillment of prophecy? And I asked, to answer that question, I asked a more important question. Does the reality match the description? What do I mean? Does the reality of what we have in the land today Mm -hmm. A secular state that is called Israel, occupied by many Palestinians. Does it match what we find in the prophecies? Now, I teach the prophets. I have a whole class and videos on this. When we read the prophecies about the restoration of Israel, we read that it's a full package that includes a renewed creation, a new heaven, a new earth, the renewal of nature, a new garden of eating, new humanity, heart circumcised, forgiveness of sins, universal and inclusive kingdom of peace and justice, restore Jerusalem, uh, a renewed glorious temple, the coming of the Messiah, it's important. You know, there cannot be a restoration without the Messiah. Israel defeating its enemies, uh, everyone being gathered in the land, life after death, building a new society, all families joining the new reality, and, and of course the big temple. And we ask, is this what we find today in the land? You judge, you've been, many of you have visited, is this what we find no. in the land uh, today? By the way, the, the response we've heard from so many people, well, it comes on, on stages. So first they are gathered in the land, and then all of this will happen. Of course, we've been waiting, as Jonathan said, we've been waiting since 48 and 67, and then we continue to wait, and we continue to wait. And by the way, those who say this are the ones who are often silent or very just. So we continue to wait. We are, maybe we need to reinterpret these prophecies again. Okay. Number seven, the land as, in the Hebrew scripture, uh, the land as an inclusive and universal reality. I talked about the expansion of the land, the non-fixed borders of the land, but it's fascinating when we read the Hebrew scripture, how we read about the inclusion of so many families from outside of biblical Israel. Just a few examples. Read Psalm 87, it speaks about Jerusalem as a multinational city, with all these citizens that are named, registered in Jerusalem and called part of Jerusalem because it is the city of God, it's not the city of Israel, it's the city of God. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, Ezekiel 47 talks about the Israelites sharing their inheritance with the strangers who dwell among them, they shall be to them like the native born. By the way, Ezekiel 47 is the exact opposite of the policy of Israel today uh, with the nation state law, which says the right for self-determination is exclusive to the Jewish people only. Ezekiel 47 says, don't do that. 
You treat all people equal. You consider the strangers who dwell among you like the native born. And we shared yesterday about even how we can get visas for our spouses to live with us. So you see, again, you see the exact contrast of, of the reality with, uh, with the description. Isaiah 56 speaks about nations joining Israel, coming to Israel, and how the temple shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. What a radical statement to be said thousands of years ago. Uh, in a time when, again, let's, let's consider first century Palestine, how uh, there was a, a big yard and a wall that divides people. And Jesus comes and, and, and destroys that and quotes this verse. My house shall be a house of prayer for all of you. It's really important. And Abraham, after all, his name was changed from Abraham to Abraham because he used to be called a father of Again, I'm, I'm walking fast paced, but I'm not, I'm just opening our eyes to different things in the Bible. Uh, what about the New Testament? Uh, I, I happen to believe, you know, I, I used to believe that the New Testament does not mention the land a lot. Actually, I was wrong. The New Testament mentions the land a lot. But we cannot ignore the New Testament when it comes to the land. For example, when Jesus said it's all about me and Luke, when all the prophecies are fulfilled in me, when Paul says all the promises find their yes in Jesus, all the promises, should we include the land promise in this? Yes. Right? Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh, everything finds its combination in the Jesus story. Jesus, and I think Yusuf really hit it on, on the point yesterday, yeah. who are Abraham's children? Jesus was clear who are Abraham's children. Uh, he expanded the people of God. He says, people will come from the east and the west and from the north and the south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And it won't be two peoples. That's why I loved his, his presentation yesterday. Jesus said in John 10, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also that they will listen to my voice. They will be one flock and one shepherd. Mm. We don't sit at the table and uh, the first people of God, the Israelites, get the land as a physical inheritance, and the spiritual people of God, the Gentiles, you get heaven as, as your inheritance. Where did we get this? I don't know. It's all about coming together uh, in Jesus, my dear, as one people. Jesus spoke about the kingdom. Again, sorry to be repeating Yusuf's presentation yesterday. On earth as it is in heaven. Remember Psalm 2? Ask of me, the Messiah says. God tells the Messiah, I will give you the, end, the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession. This now becomes a reality when Jesus, the resurrected Son of God, the King of the world says, uh, He says, all authority in heaven on an earth has been given to me. And then gives us the kingdom mandate. Go and make disciples of all nations. This is something that is being realized at last. Ethnos. He uses ethnos. All ethnicities. Exactly. He tells us go from Jerusalem into Judea, into Samaria, into the ends of the earth. That's what South Africa is in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so we have not just the universalization of the land, but even of the people of God. This confirms the Hebrew scripture. This is not a, un, an unexpected result of the cross. Again, reminding you of, 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 of Yusuf's presentation yesterday. This was the original plan. The cross was not a failure. Number 10. This was mentioned many times yesterday. How Paul reads the Abrahamic inheritance. Galatians 3.16. The seed is not many, the seed is one, and that is Christ. How, how people still speak about ethnic Israel as the seed of Abraham. I'm talking about Christians now. Again, if, if Jewish people, this is how they read their Bible, I respect that. We have dialogue. That's fine. But how can a Christian read these verses and continue to emphasize that there is a spiritual descendants and a physical descendants of Abraham? It's beyond my mind. Yeah. And by the way, this is a literal reading. You want me to read my Bible literally? There it is. Not only that, you know, uh, 
Galatians 3.16, I talk about, uh, for as many of you as baptized, this was read many times yesterday, you, if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the, what do I inherit? Seriously, what do I inherit? One third. Could you please go back to the previous slide? Especially the bottom bullet. Yes, Abraham receives the promise that he would inherit the cosmos. That's Romans 4.13. Again, because the promise that, that Jesus, that you see here we have Paul reading the Abrahamic promises, not as promises of Canaan, yeah. but as promises of Earth. Yeah. This confirms when we talk about the universalization uh, of the land. A massive, massive statement that we find in Paul. Um, we are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens. Uh, we are co-heirs in Ephesians 3, 6. Co-heirs. I was once debating a, you know, uh, a Messianic Jew, friendly environment, and, and he's like, yes, but maybe there needs to be remain a distinction in Christ between Jew and Gentile. Because there is always a distinction between male and female, so if there is no male and female, it's not that they become one, there is always a distinction. Maybe you've heard this argument uh, before. Uh, and, and just to quickly uh, uh, respond uh, to, that, to that thing, uh, first of all, I don't think there should be a distinction between male and female in the body of Christ. I hope you're with me on this. Uh, second, uh, if we maintain that there remains to be a distinction, then we maintain that there must be a distinction between free and slave in the body of Christ. Far be it from this, right? In other words, I think that Paul's point is the exact opposite. There should be no distinction. Uh, that all these boundaries we put should be removed. In Christ, we are all uh, the same. We don't get, as I said, uh, as I've heard from so many people, Christians inherit heaven and Israel inherits the land. I don't know where it is. Uh, does this mean that Christians replaced Israel? Does this mean that the church replaced Israel? Does this mean that Christians replaced Jews? I don't think that is the language that Paul or the Bible is comfortable with. Uh, what we have here in the first century is Gentile Christians being incorporated into Israel as a result of their faith in Christ. We join the people of Israel, if you wish. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul calls attention, the attention of the Corinthians to the experience of our fathers. Do you see this? So now the Corinthians became part of the family of Israel. They joined the Greek of Israel. I always tell my students, what right do you have to sing, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want? It's not our story. It's not our song. But because we became, we believed in the God of Israel, we became part of the Greek of Israel, that becomes our song. Abraham, Moses, David, are all our fathers now. This is not just a spiritual connection. This is how Paul reads the story. We have joined the biblical Israel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 2, Paul says to the Gentiles that they were Gentiles. Hayes. These phrases indicate that Paul thinks of the Corinthians Christians as Gentiles no more. Uh, so it's not about replacing but joining, the church did not replace Israel's so continuation. Uh, the first church actually consisted of Jewish believers in Christ and then Gentile believers in Christ. The common factor is Christ. In Christ, everyone comes in. Uh, this is a mystery, Paul says, that has been revealed. Uh, and I love this quote from James Dunn about the olive tree. God has not uprooted the olive tree of Israel and replaced it with another. On the contrary, uncultivated branches of wine have been grafted into the olive tree of Israel, the same original planting. I hope now it becomes more clear. Uh, so this is not about replacing or eliminating the Jews. This is not about replacing or eliminating biblical Israel. And even when we say that we have joined and so on, and that some branches were cut off, that gives us no right whatsoever to sin against the branches that were cut off. I hope you hear this is important. The state of Israel today. Having argued in my first 11 points that I don't believe Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy or that um, 
the, I don't believe in the language of divine right and so on. Am I saying that Israel now must be destroyed? I think Jonathan was brilliant in his response yesterday on this. We have a reality that we have to deal with. So we accept Israel as a secular state. I'm fine to deal with that. As long as it is abiding by the international law. That's all we're asking. Is it too much? Seriously, is it too much to ask that Israel abides by the international law? What we have a problem with is the language of divine right. I have a problem with this language. I have a problem with the language of fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, because all of this has been used to cause a silence of an injustice. People say, well, uh, Jews have a, uh, a, a historical connection. I say, yes. But does that translate into a historical right? No. Because many other nations and faiths have a historical connection with the land. This would be like saying, Muslims today can go to Spain and say, we lived there for 800 years, we established an Islamic kingdom, we have a divine entitlement to Spain today. That would be ridiculous, right? I hope you get my point. I'm not denying that Jews lived in our land for thousands of years. So did other nations. So did Christians and Muslims, other faiths as well. So to exclude everyone and say, because Jews lived in the land, it is a Jewish land, I mean, that's ridiculous. Sadly, that's an argument many Christians use today. And we go back to history and say, who came first? Well, the Canaanites were here first. So let's look at the descendants of the Canaanites and Jebusites, because that's, you know, they were there before, right? Read the Bible. And do a DNA test and figure out the Canaanites and kick everyone out and keep the Canaanites. That's ridiculous. But these are the arguments I find in Christian websites. You know, that again, drives me crazy. Those Israelites were there before anybody else. No, they were. I hope you get my point. We need to reframe the discussion. Uh, I get so many journalists who visit Bethlehem and ask me the question, how do you, you know, it's in the Bible and so on. And I say, I find it really ridiculous that we are in the year 2019, we're trying to solve a very complicated conflict about human rights and occupations by going back to the Bible 4,000 years ago and saying who was promised the land, who are the physical descendants today, and that's, is this, is this the best we can get with as Christians? What happens? Is this, is this, you get me? So I hope we find Jesus' work on peacemaking and, and justice. We take them more seriously rather than going to these prophecies and inherit what this becomes clear. So in that context, justice matters, sisters and brothers. Uh, and I, you know, I, I don't feel I have to push this point hard, especially in this context. Justice and equality matters. This is the verse from Deuteronomy 16. Justice and all the justice you shall follow that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This applies to biblical times. This applies today. This applies not just to our context, but it applies in every context, even in the South African context. If there is no justice today, I believe there is no future for any community. Justice matters. We should take that seriously. Uh, justice matters to inherit the land. Uh, because the Lord is the God of justice. You see Isaiah 30, 18. Justice is not something that, you know, fancy uh, liberal uh, Christians argue for. This is not for, uh, you know, those who call for social justice as if, you know, it's, it's at the heart of knowing God according to Jeremiah. They should know me as the God who executes justice. You cannot claim to know God and not be concerned about justice. We ask this simply, is there justice in our life today? Or is there discrimination? I mentioned so many times, for example, not just the occupation, uh, but the uh, nation state law that Israel just passed. You know, I challenge Christians, how can you be a Christian Zionist, a Christian and support this? How can you? A, a, a law that clearly discriminates. Uh, where we have an occupation where people are humiliated on a daily basis. How, how can we continue to justify that as, as Christians? What am I proposing then? What we propose today is, first of all, Frank said yesterday, liberating the Bible. Maybe again, that's the thing. Uh, Kairos Palestine has clear words and clear, I, I love it about Kairos, it doesn't use diplomatic language. The occupation is a sin. It's a sin because it distorts God's image. And the Palestinian and the Israeli, 
and salvation. We have a problem when, for example, here we have the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations holding a Bible, defending Israel's right to build settlement. We say in Kairos, any use of the Bible, and I think this, this must be very relevant, any use of the Bible to legitimize or support political options and positions that are based upon injustice, imposed by one person on another or by one people on another, transform religion into human ideology and strip the word of God of its holiness, its universality, and truth. We need to liberate the Bible. And we need to move forward. It's not enough to say what we don't believe in. Let me articulate what we hope for. What we hope for is, is this reality in which, and I frame this in my book, we will talk more about resources later, sharing the land. The idea of the land as a place for peace, justice, and reconciliation. And it begins with the realization that our land, like any land, belongs to God, and it does not belong to any nation or ethnicity or religion. We all belong at the same time to the land because it is God's land. And as such, we must find ways of sharing this land. Sharing is so much trickier than dividing the land. When we divide the land, we put a wall in the middle, and usually who builds the wall is the stronger side. And then we argue where the wall was built, but the stronger side already determined where the wall is built. And then we say, I don't want anything to do with you. You stay on your side, I, I, I am on my side. Uh, and then we began dehumanizing the other, creating fear of the other among our own people. Uh, and, and saying, you know, somehow we don't want peace, uh, we don't have nothing to do with you, but somehow we think that these walls create peace. I have no idea where it is. Again, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't add up. I hope, I hope you agree with me. As such, we must find a place. We must create a reality in which all the dwellers of the land share the land and its resources equally, have the same rights and responsibilities, regardless of their ethnicity, religion, or nationality. A shared land theology emphasizes that there are no second-class citizens in the land. No one should be marginalized in God's vision of the land. This is what we should strive for. Regardless of which political reality is implemented, whether one state, two state, confederate, you know, this should be what the church fights and calls for. A reality in which we all share the land with one another, respecting one another, having the same rights, no one should be treated as second-class citizens. Kairos says something very powerful. Through our love, we will overcome injustice and establish foundations for a new society, both for us and our opponents. Our future and their future are one. Either the cycle of violence that destroys both of us or peace that will benefit both. I love this because it reminds us that the shared land concept is not simply an option, it is the only way forward. Uh, everything else. If we think that there's a future for the Israelis apart from that of the Palestinians or the other way around, we are delusional. We are together in this land and we have to find ways to share it. And I, as I always tell my students, our goal should not be to simply end the occupation. That's our immediate goal. Our goal is to achieve reconciliation going back to Jack's presentation yesterday. Even though we have fought one another in the recent past and still struggle today, I'm quoting from Kairos again, we are able to love and live together. We can organize our political life with all its complexity according to the logic of this love and its power after ending the occupation and establishing justice. As such, our goal right now, we need to come and, and unite, and I believe, Church, to end occupation first, and then to live together, help us establish this reality, uh, a new society in which we live as neighbors to one another, respect and love and serve one another. To me, a shared land is the only way forward. And today we will challenge you in the next session, is this what the church is promoting in its theology? Is this what the South African church is promoting in its theology? Is this what the South African church is praying for? 
And is this what you are working for? And you might say, how can we work for that? It will give some ideas. Uh, I mentioned yesterday the discussion in Christianity today. Do you remember this discussion? And I said I offered to give a response, and I wasn't allowed to give a response. But as I was engaging with them in discussion, they asked me, if we allow you to respond, what would you say? See, they were playing it safe. And I said, I would, I would ch challenge both theologians with a different question. And I will challenge the question. I wouldn't give an answer, because to me, this is not the question, the urgent one. A most urgent question would be, how can we as Christians advance peace between Israel and Palestine? When I think of the billions of dollars invested in settlements and Israeli Israel, not in peace initiatives, the ones that Jack mentioned yesterday, not even to support the presence of the church and the cause of the gospel. Sisters and brothers, we could have done a much, much better job. When we say the church has been part of the problem, we mean it. The church has been part of the problem. I wish we take this question seriously. I wish we take Jesus' calling to be peacemakers seriously. This is one of the most ignored uh, commandments by Jesus when he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. I say we don't take him seriously uh, because we, we, don't, we don't apply this. We don't do peace as, as, as Christians. Uh, or we simply say, Jesus said this, you know, if you have a problem with your noisy neighbor, go and drink coffee with him. That's not what, you know, Jesus said this in a politically charged context. He meant what he said. And for him, this is how we become children of God. And I think in the evangelical circles, we prefer a much easier way of becoming children of God. It involves raising your hand for a prayer. And you are a child of God, and then we begin claiming our entitlement. And Jesus says here, it's about being thirsty for justice. It's about being peacemakers. Peacemaking is difficult because it involves stepping into the other side, challenging your own perceptions and positions. You can't stay on one side, demonize the other end. Uh, it involves listening and taking a stand. Uh, and so sadly, so many Christians today confuse peacemaking with diplomacy, which is Let's pray for Palestinians and Israelis. I love Palestinians and I love Israelis, and let's pray for peace. That's not peacemaking. Because a peacemaker would stand with truth and, and justice. What, what Jack said yesterday about the example of his wife in the hospital. How can you just say, okay, I'll pray for you and the Israelis in that hospital? You need to speak truth to power. You need to say no to what's happening if it is unjust. You need to do that. It's not about you know, let's hug it out and Christians and, and, and you know, Palestinians and Israelis, let's come together and we pray for peace. That's not peacemaking, that's shallow diplomacy, that's, that's toothless Christianity, in which we don't want to offend anybody and end up not saying anything. Because we're so careful in what we say, hoping not to offend anybody. We travel and we see this over and over in our land today. Christians who say nothing, who could care less for the situation on the ground. We see the scores of pilgrims who come to Palestine and, and the Holy Land hoping to run where Jesus walked. You know, they advertise it as walking where Jesus walked, but they're always in a hurry. From one place to the other and then. But is this really walking in Jesus' footsteps? Uh, is this how you walk in Jesus' footsteps? It's a good question. It's an important question. Uh, this reminds me of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Why? Because, you know, there's two religious people who walked by a person who was in need of help, and what did they do? The, the religious people, what did they do? They did nothing. They were probably on their way to a conference on mission, or a conference on charity, or on the mission of the church. They looked and they did nothing. The same I see people, they walk by the checkpoint, the separation wall, the refugee camp, fulfill a religious duty, they look at the Palestinian situation, and what do they do, what do they say? Nothing. At best, they might say that the situation of Palestinians is unfortunate. We came here because we think there is an urgent situation, and this is what we want to push in the next step. I've had so many conversations over the years with Christians who tell us 
that you know, after discussing the political reality, they say, well, we know that there will never be peace in the Holy Land until Christ returns. Have you ever heard this? Or Amen. Amen. As a teenager in an evangelical church, I love this answer. Why? Because it made Jesus look like this superhero who flies and rescues us. My Jesus would come and bring peace. Things changed when I actually began reading Jesus' teaching. Uh, and today, you know, with having two boys, seven and five, things are very urgent. I cannot sit and wait for God, Lord, have mercy, come and rescue us. And I say it in a way that might sound heretical. I no longer wait for divine intervention. Uh, but I believe that God calls us to action. And if God is going to intervene, first of all, God has already intervened in our world 2,000 years ago. <coughs> Jesus came. He said what needs to be said. He did what needs to be The kingdom is here. And second, if he is going to intervene today, it is going to be through you and me. We are his hands and feet on this earth. We are his voice on this earth. If there is a divine intervention today, it has to be uh, through us. And it can't be just the church in Palestine. Uh, it was said brilliant yesterday. It's not a conflict between two. The church has inserted itself into this conflict. And it's time that you join us in this path towards a shared plan, towards a more hopeful future, uh, Christians who are engaged in peacemaking. Uh, this is our theology, our Christ-centered theology of the land. Thank you.